here is, uh, is, is very similar in motivation to the one you've just seen before. And uh, you've also seen, seen uh, another talk, those of you who've been here last year, I, I understand. Uh, and so I hope this will be uh, covering the same ground again too much. Um, so this work is work by a former PhD student of mine, Andrew Manderson. Um, and uh, the motivation is uh, one which we should all be familiar with now, which is that conceptually incorporating prior information into a model is very easy. But at least I, and I think a lot of my colleagues in the in MRC Biostats unit find it quite tricky to do in practice. So in particular, it's always bugged me that uh, people, and I think this may be partly caused by, by uh, hierarchical model formulations, specified priors marginally. And then if you look at any, if you look at the predictive distribution that arises from that or any other marginal distribution, uh, it's often completely ludicrous if you look at it. Uh, and so, and, and, I, and that, that's that my, my work as well as others. Uh, and this is, uh, I've always wanted a better way to do this. So that's what got started in this. Uh, the kind of models that we are trying to fit are often multi-parameter evidence synthesis models, either in a sense generalizations of the, the, the sorts of network meta-analysis Professor Welton was talking about this morning, if that gives you some idea of where we're coming from. But in this talk, I'm, I'm going to go simple because this problem even applies in very simple situations. So here's a, here's a non-linear uh, model for the height of humans uh, through, their, through their childhood. Um, so it doesn't have so many parameters, uh, but even with this very simple model, I don't know how to choose sensible priors for all those parameters. If I did a bit of maths and I, and I calculated gradients and things, maybe I could get somewhere with some of them. But uh, altogether, I think I'd still be quite likely to specify something that ended up with a marginal predictive distribution for the, for the heights y that was completely ludicrous. And so that's what we're going to try and do better on here. So yeah, you've already been told in the previous talk a little bit, the idea of using predictive information uh, to specify priors, uh, because this is often available already, or it's easy to discuss with, with experts because it's on the scale of things that the, the subject matter expert understands. Um, it's also been argued to be more reliable. And another property that I really like is that it's model agnostic. So if you're going through all the effort of eliciting prior information, you don't want to have to redo it every time you tweak your model, which uh, isn't, isn't guaranteed for all methods. But uh, unfortunately, at least for me, it wasn't clear how to implement this method. So what we're going to do is we're going to suppose that we have predictive information available in the form of a, of a target prior uh, predictive distribution. And what we want to think about is how do we translate that back into a prior distribution for the model parameters. So in some of the some of you will, will realize that in some cases it's really obvious, right? In conjugate models, the prior predictive distribution directly uh, um, uh, determines the hyperparameters of the prior. But if you go, and then there's also some other special cases like linear models and, and things like that, where people have worked out uh, how to do this analytically. But beyond that, it's not obvious how you how you do this in general. So we wanted to see if we could help with coming up with a, a more generic model agnostic approach for this. Uh, and yeah, you, you've seen this already that the, con the conceptual site uh, was covered in the previous talk. Uh, we're going to uh, base our approach on the idea of pr predictive checks. So this is an idea that's quite common. Andrew Gelman's group is, is quite uh, an adherent to this, which is that basically if the prior predictive distribution uh, doesn't match the listed information, then you just keep tweaking it until it does. And this has been quite sensible, but it's often completely <laughs> impractical in, in, in large scale models. And so a more automated method is required. The, we, we aren't the first people to think about this, as, as you all know here. Uh, there's, there's various other direct, uh, ideas in this direction. Some of them involve marking parts of the, the observable space as, as plausible or implausible in a kind of binary way, sometimes in the kind of feedback loop. And then also uh, uh, Hartman's uh, and, and De Silva have also thought about this uh, using uh, a Dirichlet uh, model fitted to predictive quantiles. What I wanted to do, I, I find thinking about distributions directly very intuitive, and I find most of the people I work with do. And so I, I, I didn't, I don't really like the idea of thinking about this as, as data. I like thinking about distributions for prize rather than as data, which which, uh, and so I wanted to bring that more out to the front. 
So what I'm going to assume is, uh, is that we have a univariate observable quantity Y, and the model that we want to fit, I'm going to describe in terms of its cumulative distribution function, or the joint cumulative distribution function for that observable Y and the parameters of the model theta. Um, that's just because I want to think about mixed distributions, and so uh, doing that in terms of PDFs is a bit awkward. Um, I'm also going to assume that I might have covariates upon which the model is conditional X. And ultimately what I want to do is, is choose the hyperparameters lambda of the prior distribution. So obviously if you integrate out the parameters of uh, theta of that model, then we get the prior predictive distribution, uh, P of Y given uh, lambda and X. So I'm going to assume that I have R different target distributions uh, T, Y given X, R, uh, and these arise from uh, a listed uh, predictive distributions that are different values of the covariate X. And what I want to do is I want to find the hyperparameter lambda that makes that uh, prior predictive distribution, P of Y given lambda and X, uh, as close as possible to uh, all of those target distributions, those R target distributions. So going back to the human growth example, I'm going to consider two different uh, target distributions. I'm going to consider one case where I set R equal to one, and that makes the target uh, covariate independent. So I'm not going to depend on an X. And, and the, marginal, uh, the marginal distribution that I want to fit for that uh, looks like that. It's, it's, it, was, uh, it was chosen by using other data. So the data we used to fit the model, in fact, it's a mixture of three gamma distributions. And then I'm also going to consider a covariate dependent target where I have a, a Gaussian distribution for each of the, for the, the distribution of heights at four different ages of children. So uh, the, the, the idea is similar to the last talk. We're going to uh, quantify the discrepancy between the prior predictive distribution and the target uh, through a discrepancy function, which is going to be the average across the R target uh, uh, distributions and the, uh, that the we're, what we're going to average is an integrated discrepancy between the prior predictive distribution P of Y given lambda XR and our target distribution uh, T of Y given XR. Uh, we consider two different uh, specific discrepancy functions which are which are two different uh, discrepancies for the difference between two CDFs. Uh, the, the differences between those aren't important for the purpose of this talk. Um, and then ultimately what we want to do is we want to find the lambda star that minimizes that total discrepancy uh, because that's the one that is uh, what we call the most uh, the most faithful to the target distribution so it's the one that uh, accurately encodes the target distribution unfortunately it's not so simple as that because this optimization problem is often underspecified. Uh, there's often more than one uh, choice of lambda that implies exactly the same prior predictive distribution uh, or that are indistinguishable. Uh, this is not really that surprising, right? Because because especially if you've got a univariate y, then the, dis the, the dimension of your parameter space theta is often larger than one. And so you're providing information only on a, on a lower dimensional quantity. And so it's not surprising that the, there will often be uh, a non-uniqueness here. But you might, you might like uniqueness. That's the sort of kind of second property after faithfulness that we might like uh, to have if we could. Um, but what do we do if we don't have uniqueness? Well, we might want some way uh, to, sorry, we, 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 if, we, if we have two priors that are equally faithful, uh, how can we induce uniqueness if it's not there naturally? Um, so what we propose to do is, rather than simply thinking about that discrepancy, that, that, uh, that measure of how close the prior predictive distribution to the target distribution is, we're going to add another objective that describes what we want to do as well as that. Uh, and the specific object, secondary objective that we consider is, is the one that's shown here. And, and we say, don't worry about the math too much here. This essentially encodes a preference for a larger variance uh, of the components of the prior uh, distributions. And then 
you, then after that, we then just add the uh, first uh, discrepancy function that measures how uh, how close these distributions are, uh, finds some uh, weight kappa uh, for the secondary uh, objective. So our overall objective is a, is a sum of these two weighted by this this quantity kappa. So th there's lots of other choices that you might make for what the secondary uh, objective might be. Um, uh, but we, we didn't explore those. But there's, we want to see what small choice you could do here. Uh, that quantity kappa obviously determines the relative weighting of these two uh, objectives. And possibly in some cases, you might have some feeling for what you wanted that relative weighting to be. Uh, but often it's not entirely clear uh, how you would want to do that. Uh, so what you can do is you can um, uh, make a plot of, of the trade-off between these, these two objectives. So on the x-axis here, we have, have the uh, discrepancy objective, and up the y-axis, we have the, the secondary objective. And you can plot the relationship between these two and get the Pareto frontier, which is the, the set of solutions to that optimization problem that aren't dominated by any other, any other solution. And so that might guide you in your choice of, of, of kappa. I'm not going to say very much about the optimization strategy. It's not super clever. It's kind of throwing lots of computation at the problem to make it work. Uh, in, in the first step, we uh, only consider the first objective uh, using a, a standard global optimizer. And then the second step, we, we jointly try to minimize the two objectives uh, using multi-objective Bayesian optimization. And that that, that, that procedure then leads to the third kind of property that we might like this method to have, which would be that it would be replicable. And so you get the same uh, prior if you run this optimization procedure lots and lots of times. So let's go back to our, our growth example. Uh, just as for the purposes of keeping it, it simple, I'm just going to look at the Kramer von, von Mies discrepancy. And uh, on the left hand side, you can see uh, both the target distribution. Uh, in, in red, and the, the estimated marginal prior distribution, uh, prior predictive distribution uh, from 30 replications of our procedure um, in the case where we've got a single target distribution. So the red line here is that, that mixture of three gamma distributions that we looked at before. And you can see we're doing okay in, in, in matching that. We're reasonably close, but it's definitely not perfect. Uh, and uh, there's definitely some variability between different replications. Um, on the right hand side, we can see what happens if we specify four different uh, target distributions at, at four different ages. Uh, the red line again is what we're targeting, uh, and the blue lines are the estimated uh, prior predictive distributions from 30 different replications. So we're doing, we're doing okay in the middle at this uh, at age two. We're not doing so well. We're, we're too concentrated, um, but it's it's not too bad. Then on a different scale, uh, this is what the uh, estimated prior predictive trajectory of types look like under these two approaches. So in the top left, uh, what we get if we just specify one uh, target predictive distribution. So this is it's not totally it's not it's not bad, but it's it's pretty dispersed, right? There's not many uh, two oh, two year olds who are who are 150 centimeters, but maybe it's not unreasonable to have a prior that allows for that possibility. <laughs> the case where there's a covariate specific uh, target distribution, so there's a 95% intervals of of those uh, four target distributions are shown in red here. In that case, we're doing we've got a much more concentrated prior distribution, and this one. This one is, is pretty reasonable, in my opinion. On the right-hand side, and I'm always nervous about presenting this, this is our, our best uh, attempt at getting a comparison with the results that Hartman had. This is not a one-to-one -one comparison because Hartman's method is different to ours. Uh, they used four different, uh, five different experts, and this is our attempt to translate their results onto the same scale as our results. I'm, 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 I hope Andrew got this, <laughs> uh, but it, it looks ludicrous, uh, unfortunately. So that, that's what always 
makes me nervous about this. If someone if someone can see a mistake that we've done in this, then I'd be very glad to correct this because um, uh, it doesn't reflect very well. Um, okay, then finally, uh, here are the, the uh, marginal priors and posteriors uh, for two of the parameters uh, in, in that growth model. So in blue, we have the priors that were estimated by the different methods. So in the top two lines, if you want to label these columns, I think this one's H0 and that one's the way up here is randomly labeled in the middle. Um, uh, this, in, in the left-hand column, we've got H0, in the right-hand column, we've got delta S. Now in the first row, uh, we look at what happens if we put a, a flat prior. Uh, then, so we don't, we, I don't know what we can do with a prior, which is flat, but uh, then the red line show the posterior that we get if we use that prior using data from one individual who we we, uh, we identify as being the least informative individual. So this is a really hard problem. Like you've got one data point, you've got a flat prior, but you can see here that there's multimodality in the in the posterior distributions for these parameters. Um, and so that suggests that perhaps there might be a case here for a more, a more informative. Uh, for our distribution. In the second row, you can see what, what we got uh, using our approach. So in the in the blue, uh, you can see the, the estimated prior distributions for H and, and delta. So there's there's definitely not uh, complete uniqueness or, or consistency across different replications here. Uh, there seem to be two separate modes for this H0, which is kind of interesting. Uh, delta, there's 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 a reasonable concentration in one area, but there's a lot of variation between uh, specific um, prior distributions. And the posteriors are all over the place, which again, I think to some degree just reflects that there's a really difficult problem to get a, a consistent answer from. There's a lot of dependence on the specific prior. And so given our priors aren't exactly the same, it's not that surprising that you get different posteriors, although perhaps they're a bit disappointingly concentrated. In the bottom line, uh, this is the corresponding thing with, with the Hartman approach. Um, this this uh, spike out here is a bit, uh, if you think about what this parameter means, is perhaps a bit uh, uh, not so satisfactory. So in summary, the, in, for the growth model, uh, the prize that we estimate using this approach are fairly faithful to the, to the information that we supplied, although we're not actually not able to, to match all aspects of, of the uh, the target where, where we've got four different targets at both the very young children and the very old children. Um, and so that perhaps reflects uh, a lack of flexibility in, in the model, which is in some ways an interesting insight into this model, I think. Um, then secondly, it's, it's fairly clear our, our, our priors aren't fully unique or replicable. Unpicking which of those two it is is not so easy, right? What, what's what's just what's the weaknesses of our algorithm and what's the fundamental lack of uniqueness? It's not so clear exactly which the problem is. Uh, so that's that's one one simple example. We we thought about two other examples in in the in the paper. Uh, one was uh, rather than specifying a prior for a, for an observable, specify for model derived quantities specifically for R squared. People have thought about this in the context of specific shrinkage priors, but uh, it would be nice to be able to make this applicable to more uh, priors. And we also thought about this uh, pure mixture factor survival model, which I won't go into details of. The key thing about this is it's a, it's a mixed distribution, uh, and so that's why we ended up with CDS rather than PDX. So in summary, I, I think this is a, conceptually at least, is a, is a much nicer way of specifying priors. Uh, than, than the way that people often do it. Um, uh, and uh, I think I think our approach helps with, with enabling translation of, of uh, priors on observables or, or predictive uh, model derived quantities uh, into the specific parameter, hyperparameters of a prior distribution. But it's definitely not without, without challenge. This, it may not be possible to get a prior that is faithful to the target predictive distribution. Uh, in some ways, that's a, that's a challenge, but in some ways, I think that's a strength as well, that it, it gives you, if you can't get a faithful uh, match, then maybe your model's not flexible enough. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, uniqueness is often not, not satisfied. 
maybe there's more work to, and thinking to be done about secondary objectives here. And then finally, uh, there's definitely more work to do on, on optimization algorithms to improve flexibility. So if you're interested, there's, a, there's an archive preprint and an art package, there's code for examples. Uh, thank you to the Medical Research Council who funded me and to the Insurance Institute.